Well, welcome and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We are thrilled to be kicking off our 32nd annual uh, Baker Hostetler Legislative Seminar. This year we'll be doing it virtually once again. Uh, lo really looking forward to being back in person and back to normal next year. But uh, this year, as I say, we're doing it virtually once again. We're we're going to bring you the latest on infrastructure and taxes and healthcare and trade policy and more straight from the Democratic and Republican lawmakers themselves. Uh, I'm former Congressman Mike Ferguson. I'm the leader of uh, Baker Hostetler's uh, federal policy team. And my co-host on these programs and my dear friend uh, is joining us, uh, joining me here again today, a fellow senior advisor here at Baker Hostetler, Congressman Heath Schuler. Heath, it's great to be on the program again with you today. Uh, it's great to be back. Uh, great to see you, Mike. And uh, and kick off this exciting series once again. We cannot be more pleased to have one of the most important leaders in Congress and a longtime favorite guest of our legislative seminar, House Majority Whip Jim Clyburn. You know, as the whip, he's he's responsible for a lot. He's responsible for shepherding uh, successful passage of uh, President Biden's agenda on the House floor. Uh, he's the third ranking Democrat in the House and uh, Baker Hostetler, uh, uh, frequent guests will will know him as a very familiar face. He's a he's a guest at our legislative seminar every year. He's a great friend to the firm, and you know he's been in the leadership roles for pretty much all of his thirty years in elective office. Anybody who followed the twenty twenty presidential campaign uh, knows him really well. We talked about this a little bit last year. Uh, you know, the Biden campaign, I can say this as a Republican, I think the Biden campaign was really on the ropes last year as they were heading into the South Carolina uh, presidential primary. And uh, it was Jim Clyburn's endorsement three days before that primary that I really think uh, put Joe Biden over the top, propelled him to his first uh, win in South Carolina. And the rest, as they say, is history. So we're, we're delighted to have somebody of Jim Clyburn's stature and knowledge and character here with us again today. Mr. Whip, thanks again for being with us today. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mike and Heath. Uh, it's always a, a lot of fun being on this with you guys. So I want you all to keep it fun. Uh, <laughs> and let's uh, have a successful event here today. Thank you, guys. Well, thanks, Jim. It's always a lot of fun to have you and we have such great conversations, but you know, there's a lot on the agenda, a lot on President Biden's agenda, a lot on the House Democratic agenda, of course, and you know, we'll, we'll talk about all that. We'll talk about some of the specific items, but my, my first question really, Jim, is you, know, you have a caucus that uh, is pretty diverse. You know, anytime you get a majority in the House these days, it's gonna be uh, a lot of different uh, cats to sort of shepherd <laughs> Uh, and, and corral into uh, finding those 218 votes. You have folks like AOC, who is very well known to people across the country, really a progressive firebrand. And you have a lot of moderates too. You, know, you have folks like Kathleen Rice and Stephanie Murphy and other folks who have been on our, our programs before. Heath Schuler would have been in this group if it was 10 years ago. Uh, Jim, how do, you, how do you keep that group together on all of the different issues? How do you how do, you, how do you find those 218 votes every time you have to pass a bill off the floor? Well, uh, I have two things going for me when it comes to that. First of all, uh, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, uh, the Majority Leader, Senator Hoyer, were both whips. And so they understand uh, what it's like to be whipped. And they know what it, uh, how difficult it is uh, with such a diverse caucus. But secondly, I was born and raised in the Postnitz. Uh, so I pray a lot uh, <laughs> to make sure uh, things come out okay. Uh, but aside from those two fundamental things, uh, our caucus is a pretty big tent. Uh, I think most people recognize that. And under this big tent, uh, or let's say several tribes, a diversity of backgrounds and experiences. And uh, I, I tell people all the time, uh, my late wife, who uh, Heath got to know uh, very well, uh, and I stayed married for 58 years. And you don't stay married that long to one woman without knowing how uh, to fold uh, and hold uh, when you need to. Uh, and so to go back to that old 
uh, country song, you got no one to hold, no one to fold. And that's what I do uh, in trying to get to where we need to be. And though that may sound uh, a bit corny, uh, the fact of the matter is, that's exactly what happens. You sit down with people, you try to learn as much as you can about what their interests are, uh, and you try to make sure that the legislation you're bringing forward uh, is legislation that they can uh, they can support. And if you see anything in that legislation that may be a problem for them, you should tell them, let them know up front uh, that though you want their vote, here's an issue you may want to take a look at uh, and then decide whether or not you should cast that vote. So I try to be as open and as honest with people as I possibly can. And that way, things used to come out all right. Keith and I uh, got to be fast friends. Uh, he's one of the hardest people in the world to whip. Uh, getting his vote was sometimes difficult, but getting his vote was sometimes uh, what I expected. And sometimes I did not expect to get his vote. And of course, he never disappointed me. <laughs> Mike and Mike, I can always tell you there was two parts of the, those conversations always. One, I always knew that uh, the whip would be honest with me. And the second and foremost, he was a tough negotiator because I was the whip of the Blue Dogs, the, the more centrist <laughs> right. members. And so we would have a lot of conversation. He'd say, I only need six or seven. Can you get me six or seven? <laughs> and he negotiated hard when I only know he needed four. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you knew me a little better than I thought you did. <laughs> well, I have to say, I was I was on a whip team. I was not the I was not the whip, but I was on a whip team when Republicans had a five seat majority in my freshman term in Congress. And I remember how hard it is yeah. to get those two hundred and eighteen votes to get that majority to pass it, whatever it was that you were bringing to the floor. So, you know, the hot topic right now, of course, is infrastructure. Uh, there's a lot of discussions. Our old House colleague, Shelly Moore Capito, was my, my classmate in the House. She's now over in the Senate, and she's really leading the, the Republican negotiators with the White House and, and, other, and, and Democrats uh, on this package. There was news breaking last night that Republicans might come to up to a, a trillion dollar package. And it, you know, there's, I guess the devil's always in the details on these things about how much is going to be new money and how much is reprogram money. But um, Jim, do you think there's any red lines here? Do you think do you think an infrastructure package, a bipartisan infrastructure package, can really get done based on what you're seeing and how this is unfolding? And you know, you talk about when to hold them and when to fold them. There's a lot of speculation right now that you know the White House may just sort of fold on the bipartisan conversations and just move ahead with a with a Democratic package. What do you think is going to happen? Well, I think uh, several things are in the offering right here. I have no idea exactly how things would come down because so much uh, of this depends upon uh, the culture of the Senate, uh, which is 50-50, as you know. Now, I think it's foolhardy to believe uh, that you've got only half of the votes. You won't get the whole thing that you want. Uh, and that goes the same uh, for the other side as well. But I do believe that we will get to where we need to be, even if we have to split the packages up. Now, that's not coming from me. Senator Coons, you may recall, uh, a month or so ago, maybe more than a month, uh, advanced the idea uh, of splitting this uh, in two. Uh, I think when it comes to traditional uh, issues uh, of infrastructure, roads and bridges and water and sewage, rail and ports, uh, these things are pretty traditional. Uh, uh, Joe Biden uh, is where I am on these things. Going forward, there's some non-traditional stuff uh, when it comes to infrastructure that we've got to take a hard look at. Broadband uh, is right at the top of that list. Uh, we are not going to be able to educate our children adequately uh, unless we have broadband. People can't get health care uh, appropriately without telehealth and telemedicine. These things uh, are a given, and they are non-traditional. So I think that the extent to which we can have discussions about what is, in fact, infrastructure. Uh, I can take you to places in North Carolina and South Carolina, most especially 
parts of my congressional district, and you know, uh, school construction must take place uh, if we are going to be able uh, to get our children to where they need to be. And so Joe Biden is treating that uh, as an infrastructure issue. Uh, and when you start talking about uh, education, uh, you got to look at it a little more than traditional. One of the things that really irked me a little bit is when I hear people on my side saying, we got to do things so that people can send their kids to college. No, we got to do things so people can have a foundation upon which they can help their children fulfill their dreams and aspirations. You don't have to go to a liberal arts college to be an electrician uh, or to be a plumber, to be a landscaper, to be a bricklayer, uh, or to be a barber, though I don't need that much anymore. Uh, but um, these are the kinds of things we have to keep in mind when we put together this infrastructure package. So it's, it shouldn't be about top line numbers. You know, I noticed everybody talked about Joe Biden was 2.2 trillion. Uh, the Republicans came in with uh, 500 billion. Now they're up to somewhere around 1 trillion. I don't care what the top line is. What I care about is what the bottom line is. What flows from this? What are we going to produce when we get this? So I do believe there's going to be some serious discussions taking place over the next uh, two or three weeks. And I think we're going to get a good package. It may be uh, that part of it will be done uh, on traditional stuff. The other part may be done uh, on the reconciliation. Uh, but I think we'll get there. Jim, you know, one of the questions that always comes up is how, how are we going to pay for this? You know, what are the, what does that look like? And the Republicans want to talk about a user fee, very similar to like the gas tax or vehicle mileage tax. And then and the president, he would like to, you know, kind of look at it from a tax code standpoint, increase taxes in order to pay this to have an offset. You know, we're, you know, of all of us, you know, the three of us been there before, we know that sometimes there's going to be that middle ground. Do you think, you know, open up the tax code, you know, being germane in a lot of different areas, you know, what kind of problems and issue is that going to be over on the Senate side or, you know, as Manchin and others, are they going to vote for increased taxes or, you know, so how do we ultimately pay for it? Because, um, you know, it's a trillion dollars, a lot of money. You know, um, I'm glad you asked that, though. I'm not a big fan of worrying about that part of it so much. Uh, I think what we have to do is, first of all, decide what do you want to accomplish? Exactly how you want to make education available and all these other things. And then uh, start putting the numbers out there. We seem to go the other way around. You put a number and you start building out under it. So if that's the way we're going to go, then that's just the, what we're going to have to deal with. So let me tell you what my thoughts are. Uh, it gets me a little trouble with some of my friends. Uh, but I do believe uh, that we ought to pay for this infrastructure bill. And, and I think that one of the things we ought to take a look at uh, is, is maybe um, uh, what we call a transaction tax. Uh, uh, one tenth of 1% on the transaction tax will yield somewhere around $775 billion. One tenth of 1%. Now, uh, I know about the use of fees, but let me tell you something about use of fees. Back in your part of North Carolina and my part of South Carolina, uh, that's an unfair thing to do. Uh, we'll be asking farmers uh, traveling uh, their farm to market roads, buying tractors, uh, running their pickup trucks, asking them to pay uh, for inner city, trans inner city transits. Uh, I'm not too sure that's fair. Uh, I think that we ought to really think about what it is that we are trying to achieve and make sure that we don't put an undue burden on one part of our society as opposed to the other. Rural people want broadband, and they'll go to great lengths to get broadband, but they certainly don't want uh, to pay uh, for people traveling subways, uh, which they have never been on, and many of them probably would, never will be on. Well, I can certainly tell. I remember, uh, you know, 15 years ago, you can, you've been talking about broadband for, you yeah. know, 
well over a decade now. Right. So, you know, I look in my community alone when when kids were having to go to uh, to churches or you know drive up close to the libraries to where they could actually or the police departments and share, and uh, volunteer fire departments started putting Wi-Fi in where you know those students sure. and they were sitting in their cars for five and six hours a day having to you know do their classes in a vehicle. And yeah. so, uh, I mean, I know that's very difficult. So, you know, continue the hard fight. Uh, broadband is needed, certainly in a lot of areas. I know in South Carolina and and uh, all over our country. So keep up the good fight. One of the things that, that continues to be a negotiating point is climate and environmental provisions, you know, are, are, are included in this. You know, how do we look at nuclear? Uh, if we look at, you know, how is nuclear being looked upon uh, by the president and the Democratic caucus as a, uh, an option. Well, I sure hope it's look, being looked upon favorably, as you probably remember. Uh, I've been pro-nuclear for a long, long time, uh, and I'm pro-nuclear for several reasons. One is uh, it's the cleanest. When you start talking about the environment, it's the cleanest. Uh, I know the fear uh, that a lot of people have because of some past experiences, but look, um, I'm not care what we do. Uh, we have to do it uh, in a safe and secure way. And I think you can do nuclear uh, safely and secure it, uh, securely. Now, here's the deal. Here in South Carolina, today, uh, about 54, 55% of our energy is nuclear. I don't know what that number is uh, in the North Carolina, but I found out what it was up in Illinois. And the reason I did is because Barack Obama and I had some toe-to-toe -to -toe, uh, discussions uh, about uh, uh, nuclear. And I had to remind him on more than one occasion that the majority of the energy in Illinois comes from nuclear. So uh, we were able to get to a pretty good place now. Uh, you know what the experience we just had here in South Carolina with one of our nuclear facilities. Uh, I would hope that that would not be uh, the same going forward. But hopefully we'll learn from our mistakes. We'll be honest and open uh, with people. When things go bad, admit that we're going bad and we need to try a different way. But nuclear has got to be on the, uh, in the equation, I think, uh, if we're going to have it. Now, you know, smorgasbord, you've heard me say that word before. Uh, I believe in wind and solar. Uh, and I believe uh, in nuclear as well. Hey, uh, Jim, I'm a, I'm the Republican here. So I got to ask you about taxes. <laughs> uh, the, uh, you know, I, if there's some conversation I've heard among some members that if you, if you do end up getting a, a bipartisan infrastructure package and then try to do, you know, a second package under reconciliation later, the American families plan, which would uh, presumably include raising taxes or making some changes to the tax code. A lot of the Democrats I talk to who, you know, are up for re-election next year in a midterm election, you know, concerned about voting for raising taxes. Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, very, very thin margin in the House, as you well know, 50-50 in the Senate. Some folks say it's, 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 uh, might be better just to do it at bipartisan infrastructure package and not do the second package. So, you know, a lot of the folks don't have to take that tough vote. Um, what, what's your crystal ball say? What, what, what's going to happen on that? And what's the timing? Will that be, if it happens, would it be before the end of this year? Well, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but let me tell you where I stand on that. Um, yeah, I saw a number yesterday, uh, 62%. You remember what that number was? That was Joe Biden's favorability yesterday. And uh, I also saw another number that was over 70%. That had to do with Joe Biden's tax plan. Over 70% of the American people uh, support his idea uh, of raising taxes on people uh, over $400,000 a year. Uh, and when you look at the percentage of people that that will apply to, uh, those are people that I'm not too sure uh, many of the people in my caucus will get their votes anyway. So I don't know uh, that that is a big, big deal with the majority in my caucus. But I'm going to remind people, Mike, uh, especially my Republican friends, I'm going to ask them. Now, 
which letter or phone call I got from you when we had that $1.9 trillion tax cut that benefited, 80% uh, of the benefits went to uh, uh, less than 20% of the people in the country. Uh, uh, did I get a letter from you <laughs> or a phone call about that? Uh, come on, let's be fair here. So uh, I think that um, uh, tax cuts may be attractive, but I'll tell you what is more attractive to me is preserving the integrity of this democracy, making sure that all of our citizens are treated fairly and all of them will have access to the greatness of this country. Uh, as uh, uh, Heath will tell you, uh, the liberty and justice for all is the way I close the pledge that we all do. But the big thing to me is making this country's greatness accessible and affordable for all. And I don't think you can do that uh, by not uh, making investments in educating our children, taking care of the elderly, uh, doing the infrastructure that needs to be done. Uh, and that's the way you generate uh, economic opportunity. So, so you sound bullish on, on the package. Uh, what do you think happens then with like the SALT? That seems to be maybe one of the most controversial provisions for Democrats is what do you do with this SALT provision? Obviously, yeah. Senator Schumer wants that uh, eliminated and, and you know some of your moderates, Josh Gottheimer, some of your New sure. York, New Jersey folks. But then you have folks from you know other states, uh, Stephanie Murphy and folks from redder states or from swing districts who, you know, look at that as a, a big giveaway to, to wealthy taxpayers in, in bluer states. How do you how do you manage that kind of a provision in a in a tax package? You no, know, I think state and local taxes are things that we ought to be concerned about. Uh, and that old salt provision that's set for state and local taxes, uh, I think is something we ought to be very sensitive to, because I know it's easy to say that the uh, big state people, New York is big on it, New Jersey is big on it, but it helps a lot of uh, people, uh, middle-income people uh, in smaller states as well. And so I do believe that you can uh, put some kind of means uh, testing or whatever we may call it, uh, but take a look. Uh, the same way we did with uh, mortgages on uh, houses and stuff, uh, taxes on automobiles. Though I still think the tax on automobile, sales tax on automobiles is too low, uh, I do believe that we ought to say uh, that uh, we ought to look at salt taxes and see can it, it be some kind of way means tested. So you think there might be a middle ground on that? To I do think so. I, I, I really believe that uh, on most of the things that we talk about, uh, there is middle ground if we develop the will to find it. Mm. My dad used to tell me all the time, Sunday is always a way. But the big problem is developing the will. Huh. Let's look more on the international front. Uh, Senate Majority Leader Schumer is leading the way on the, uh, you know, he's been the, the Democratic hawk on China. Um, I think he's been very aggressive this week on a timeline of the Endless Frontier Act uh, to provide U.S. Comp uh, a very comprehensive. You know, what do you think about, you know, do you think it's going to pass out of the Senate and will you take up that legislation or something very similar in the House? Well, you know, um, I was hoping that we we're going to get through this with you asking me about some the, these foreign stuff that I don't uh, profess to know a whole lot about. I don't study uh, those issues uh, as well as some of my colleagues. And there are people who I trust on those issues. Um, as you know, uh, Shula is sort of a hawk uh, when it's coming to the China stuff. No bigger hawk than Nancy Pelosi, uh, I might add, <laughs> uh, when it comes to China. Uh, so I kind of step back uh, and, and let those uh, people uh, who spend time on this look at it. And then I'll step in and when they tell me it's in good enough shape to try to get the votes for it. Uh, as I said earlier, she used to be a whip, Stenia Hoyer, who sets the schedule, determines what comes to the floor, used to be a whip. Uh, so when they start putting these things together and say they want to get the votes, I remind them uh, that you've been where I am. And let's just make sure you get it right uh, before you ask us to vote for it. But having said that, I, um, 
I don't have any strong feelings about uh, those things. Uh, uh, I really uh, can find most of my real in-depth uh, studies to the domestic stuff. Yeah. So the debt limit's coming up July 31st. Uh, Democrats have made it very clear they won't negotiate on um, spending cuts in exchange as Republicans have demanded. Um, but will you have the budget? But will you have to use the budget reconciliation uh, in the Senate to be able to pass this legislation? Well, you know, I am one of those people who really believe that we ought to get rid of this debt limit. I've been saying that for several years now. I mean, what 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 is it? Uh, every year we bump up to it and we uh, raise it and and we're going back to doing business. Uh, how many countries in the world got a debt limit? Uh, we might be the only one. Uh, there may be one or two others, I don't know. But I do know this, that I think that um, uh, that is something we ought to, we got it. So uh, expand it, do whatever, raise it, do what we need to do, and go on and run the country. So the debt limit, uh, nobody is, we aren't going to default uh, on our bills. What we got to do is create an economy that will allow us to uh, generate the jobs that are necessary uh, for people to go to work and pay taxes, and they'll pay down the debt, uh, help close the deficit, uh, hopefully in the not too distant future, eliminate that deficit. But the debt ceiling has got to be raised. Jim, I, got, I know we're short on time. I got two quick ones I'd love to get in and just get your thoughts on. Uh, big tech has been uh, in the news and getting lots of criticism from both sides of the aisle and a lot of people talking about possible repeal of Section 230 of the, uh, the Communications Decency Act. Um, what, uh, it, it seems that the FCC is really reluctant. You're very familiar with the FCC, of course. Uh, the, uh, the FCC seems re reluctant to sort of take this on. So my first question is, do you think uh, there will be congressional action on this? because there seems to be a lot of folks on both sides who are talking more and more about possibly a repeal of Section 230. My first question is, what, what do you think the odds are of Congress acting on that this year? I think the odds are pretty good that Congress will act on it. Uh, whether or not there's going to be an out not repeal, I don't know. Uh, you are right. Uh, my daughter Mignon uh, spent almost five, nine years uh, over there at the FCC. And maybe that's the reason she didn't want to go back. Uh, <laughs> Joe Biden <laughs> invited her uh, back to the position. In fact, uh, to, to the chairmanship, really. But she says, no, I've done that. I'm, I'm moving on. Uh, and maybe that's why she decided to move on. Uh, we talked about this that a lot. And it is a tough issue. But I do believe that there must be a balance. You know, I, I, there's a real problem that we have with so many things. We look at the First Amendment, and the Supreme Court has told us there are limitations on free speech. We look at the Second Amendment, and even Scalia, in writing, has written that there's a limitation on the Second Amendment. And I think when you look at 230, uh, this whole notion of, of, of absolutism, that you are absolutely free to do uh, put whatever you want out there in the ethos. I don't know uh, that that's a good place to be. Uh, we ought to take a hard look on what the impact of all of us is and make the modifications that are necessary uh, for people to enjoy uh, whatever their freedoms might be. Uh, but free speech has limitations. So my last question, Jim, and thanks so much for your time. Um, uh, you know, we've coming through this pandemic now, we've seen three American companies working closely with our federal government to come up with vaccines, which are really, I think, doing a great job of putting this pandemic in the rearview mirror as much as possible, as quickly as possible. Incredible innovation. Uh, Democrats in the House have been uh, have a bill, HR three, that would, um, you know, that fo some folks are, are concerned what what that would do in uh, to harm potentially harm innovation. In the, in the pharmaceutical industry and in life sciences. In fact, some of your members, I think 10 of your members of the Democratic Caucus, I think signed a letter recently raising some concern and trying to find balance between innovation and affordability for folks to be able to afford their medicines. 
What do you think is going to happen there? And, and is, there a, is there an opportunity for some middle ground there? I hope so. I really hope there's a middle ground. Uh, once again, I'm a great believer in science. I'm a great believer in research. Uh, as you know, uh, my, life, my wife uh, lost a 30-year battle with diabetes. Uh, and nobody, uh, I get a lot of flack from a lot of people uh, about where my relationships are. And for some reason, uh, because I vote so much for research, uh, they tend to tie that uh, to being in the pockets of pharmaceuticals. No, I'm all in when it comes to research. I wanna see a cure for cancer, cystic fibrosis, multiple, multiple sclerosis. I wanna see uh, us do something about diabetes. Uh, I know uh, what it does. Uh, so um, I'm all in for research. And so to the extent to which a balance can be reached uh, when it comes uh, to research and affordability, uh, I want, as I said, the greatness of this country to be accessible and affordable. And so there's no need to have good drugs for diabetes and everything else if people can't afford it. So there's a balance that's got to be struck. And so I, I'm all there and I congratulate uh, Pfizer, I congratulate Moderna, uh, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson for the things that they, have they've done something that has never been done in the history of this country. Uh, see, I'm old enough to remember uh, the polio vaccine. Uh, John Assault, in fact, Albert Sabin, uh, with the second vaccine, uh, you are retired from the Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, and I got to meet him. Uh, so I was very proud of that. I, my fraternity, the brother Charles Drew, uh, what he did with research when it came to how we can store medicine, uh, uh, blood to save it until we need it. When you look at that, research should not be sacrificed. But we need to make sure uh, that things remain affordable. Jim, you're a great guest and a great friend to Baker Hostetler Heath. Uh, he never fails to never fails to, to to satisfy, does he? He's just the great very guy. best. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Jim Clyburn, we are honored to have you, the uh, the majority whip of the house. Uh, you are a great public servant and uh, and have been a great friend to us. So thank you again for joining us this year. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you in person, we hope, very soon. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, this virtual stuff is good and efficient, but it ain't as effective as I would like for it to be. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so, but uh, So we'll sign off on this, this uh, episode. Uh, welcome all to the uh, first episode of our 32nd annual Baker Hostetler Legislative Seminar. And we look forward to uh, having you join us with uh, future guests in the coming weeks. Thank you again to the Majority Whip, Jim Clyburn. And uh, Heath, great to see you and look forward to joining you again soon. Great to Thank see you guys. Thanks, Jim.